Hey guys, welcome to my presentation about the Great Pyramid. Okay, first of all, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. I just know like the basic fundamentals, you know, and so I'm just gonna tell you what I know and what I think is going on here. All right, literally, there's no time to waste because there's so much information to go through, I don't even know where to begin. We're not gonna get too much into the geometry and everything of the Great Pyramid because that's been covered to death by people on the internet. Just know that it's really big. But I do wanna share with you their unit of measurement that they used to design the Great Pyramid, which is amazing, but it's called the cubit, and it's based on one-sixth of a circle. But the problem is you gotta define the diameter of that circle, and they use the meter, which is a common meter that we use today, and there's a really great story about how they came up with that, but uh, I don't have time for it in this presentation. Moving on. So here I just want to show you the relationship between the Great Pyramid and the Earth and how it's sitting on the Earth compared to the celestial poles and the ecliptic poles and the galaxy. And one thing you'll notice is that the pyramid is almost situated perfectly under the galaxy during the winter at midnight or during the summer at noon. And then at the summer at midnight and the winter at noon, it's over on the other side, the uh, Earth pointing up, but it's kind of like nowhere near the galactic alignment at this point. So I just want you to see that because it's really important for what we're going to talk about later on in the future and how this pyramid is aligned with the galaxy at certain times of the year and that's kind of what the goal of it is. Okay, so the thing that really gave this uh, whole theory away to me was these two structures in the pyramid that are kind of a mystery to everybody else. A different researcher pointed out that these air shafts or star shafts are 21.1 centimeters wide. That is really special when it comes to radio astronomy, which I'll get into in the upcoming slide here. But the very first thing I noticed is these kind of remind me of antenna that you would put on the top of your television. No joke. Like these look like rabbit ears. Antenna. And so that triggered like a wave of eurekas in my mind. Having a 21.1 centimeter wide antenna or, or tube or shaft, whatever you want to call it, is perfect representation of a waveguide. And waveguides are what we use in radio astronomy to transmit the information we collect from the dishes into the equipment that analyzes that information. We also use waveguides and microwaves, the thing you use to cook your food, so it transmits the magnetic field into the microwave itself. We use a waveguide to do that. Okay, so the interesting thing about these waveguides is at the very end of them, in the Queen's Chamber waveguides anyway, there's these two copper pins that are sticking out of the wall and they're bent downwards. The only explanation for these pins, in my mind, is that they are used to create the waves for the waveguide. I mean, here is a textbook example of how we would use coaxial pins to create a wave down a waveguide. And we use these pins in a very specific geometry to create very specific waves. And so the fact that these two pins are in there and pointing downwards means that perhaps one of them is a negative and a positive pin and that they are trying to transmit this particular mode of a waveguide because waveguides can have many, many modes. The topics of waveguide is extremely complicated. So I don't want to really get into too much of it, but if you want, you can look into it for yourself and see the wonderful world of waveguides. It's just disgusting. But if you want to really understand the pyramid, you have to understand that everything in the pyramid is behaving like a waveguide. Okay, and we're dealing with megahertz. We're dealing with extremely high frequencies like gigahertz and megahertz. Okay, moving on. I don't want to get too complicated with this. In radio astronomy, we use a configuration of antenna called a dipole or a V-dipole antenna, and the Great Pyramid is an exact representation of that V-dipole setup. When you want to transmit radio waves a long distance, you have to use a carrier signal, and then whatever information you want to send using that carrier signal, you then amplify it and modulate it and send it along with that carrier signal, and it completely modulates the carrier signal, so that whoever's receiving this information can then tune into the carrier signal and demodulate the modulated frequency and then hear whatever information or see whatever information was being sent. I know, really complicated. So, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that you have one antenna creating a carrier signal and then you'll have a second antenna that modulates the signal and amplifies it and sends it along with the carrier signal. And here I've shown examples of modern day V dipole antennas and then you can compare it to the Great Pyramid and see how kind of like they're set up. Another thing that you got to keep in mind is that when you're trying to create these antennas you want them to be the same width because you're trying to transmit that wavelength of frequency. So here in the Great Pyramid is the explanation as to why these two shafts are the same width and why the Queen's Chamber shafts don't completely go to the outside because then it would completely defeat the purpose of transmitting a wave information. So what I'm saying here is that these two dipole antenna are waveguides set to the frequency of 21.1 centimeters and one is a carrier signal and one is a modulated amplified signal. Just based on these two structures alone you can tell that much about the Great Pyramid. And now I'll get more into the details of how these 
rooms function for that purpose. Oh my god. I know that was really complicated, but we had to get through that in order to get on, move on. So we're gonna move through this a little more quickly now. So here's just another interesting thing about these two antennas configuration. If you look at them as antenna, you'll notice that they have the same angle when compared to each other. They're set up with 102.4 degrees roughly between each other. And now if you map them on top of each other, you'll notice that this is the truth. And what's interesting about this uh, configuration is that they're both pointing to the same point on the Great Pyramid, which happens to be the apex. And that having one offset to the other is kind of like inducing a spiral around the carrier signal. I know this is really complicated, I don't want to get too much into it, but you'll just see here for yourself that it's kind of creating this spiral-like geometry, and now we'll get kind of into the reason why. So, in modern astronomy, in modern radio astronomy, we've noticed that this peculiar wave band called the uh, hydrogen wave band, or hydrogen line, is radiating out a wavelength of 21.1 centimeters. And the very special thing about this is that this particular wavelength has the ability to cut through the dust and gas and all that stuff and other interferences in the galaxy in order to make it through to Earth in order for us to detect this. And with our modern radio astronomy, we notice this high peak in the particular band here, which is mapped out in green in this color, showing you where 21.1 one centimeter hydrogen line is located. The reason why this is important is that if you want to transmit a signal through the galaxy, you want to use some kind of signal that won't get interfered by stuff, right? So modern radio astronomers like the SETI project and all that believe that the hydrogen line will be used by intelligent beings out there to transmit information across the galaxy. It just makes sense because this carrier doesn't get interrupted by anything. And the amazing thing is that it's the 21.1 centimeters wide. It's the same width as our waveguides in the Great Pyramid. And the fact that these antenna are pointed upwards means that they're radiating a frequency upwards or they're detecting information from the sky downwards. There's no other reason for them to be in a V pointed upwards. You can't detect a signal coming in from the side with a V pointed upwards. It just doesn't, it just won't work very well. It's better to have it pointed in the direction that you want to detect your signal. So obviously they're trying to detect signals coming in from the sky down. And here I even showed you a map of how the pyramids are located in correlation to the, the galaxy in the sky at the time. Just a little more evidence that they might have been detecting or transmitting information to and from this particular wavelength. Moving on! Alright, so here's some amazing information about the Queen's Chamber, so-called Queen's Chamber. This room is based on phi, so if you take the uh, width of this room and you divide it by phi, it marks the center point of that niche, the little Queen's niche there with all those little jagged edges. Okay, and the special thing about the niche is that if you look at this room as a resonant cavity for waveguides, that niche will take a specific frequency and actually amplify it and add certain frequencies to that amplification before adding those resonant frequencies to the room. So it kind of like attenuates, it attunes the sound almost and uh, creates a sort of frequency in this room that generates a particular tone, a note. All right, but we're dealing with megahertz we're dealing with radio frequencies and high, high frequencies, stuff like uh, wireless frequencies that we use nowadays to transmit wireless information around. Same thing. It's very possible that the Queen's Chamber has some missing pieces, certain bits of equipment that might have been taken out or removed. Possible, maybe not, not necessary, I'm not too sure, but we'll get into it later. I just want you to take away that the Queen's niche is acting as a horn, an open-ended horn for high frequencies. And so it's it's basically tuning the room to a resonant frequency, to a specific frequency. It's its job. Okay, so here we're going to quickly cover the Grand Gallery and how it behaves like an amplifier modulator. So a wave that is projected into this room from the bottom upward will kind of bounce around and reflect off of the ceiling and the floor and so on as it travels up this gallery. And when it does that, as it hits the ceiling and comes back down, it becomes amplified and a whole bunch of different frequencies get added to this wave. But then as it travels downward and gets near the bottom, they seem to get cancelled out in the corners. All the lower frequencies get cancelled out in the corners and only the high frequency bounces off the floor back upward. But it's like amplifying the source and filtering it at the same time before reflecting the wave again. So the wave starts at the top at two cubits wide and then as it travels downward, it moves through seven steps and becomes one octave higher because the base is four cubits wide. But the very floor there where it's got that like one cubit wide step, the very floor is two cubits wide. So it's like it's amplifying it to four cubits and then only reflecting the two cubit width wave back upwards. This waveguide is incredibly complicated. And then you'll also notice this mysterious notch that is exactly halfway up. That notch is acting 
as a low pass filter to kind of like filter out a specific frequency there. And what's interesting is that if you measure the width of that area in cubits, it's actually pi, it's 3.14 and a bunch of digits. But yeah, it works out to being pi in cubits in that width. And I'm assuming that they're, they have that little low pass filter there to get rid of the infinity of pi so-called, or maybe it adds some kind of fractal wave as a noise and they want to cancel that out at this point, I'm just guessing. But that's one explanation for that notch being there, because nobody can really explain why that notch goes there and it travels all the way up the Grand Gallery. So a couple of quick details I want to point out that at the base of the Grand Gallery there are these little notches that used to contain limestone blocks and then they maybe had some kind of, maybe they held some kind of devices, I'm not too sure, that uh, would attenuate the sound or tune the sound. Who knows? I'm not too sure. But the point of uh, having limestone blocks here next to these granite blocks is that the granite is behaving like a conductor of electricity because granite is a really good source of uh, a really good conductor of electricity and limestone is kind of like a really good insulator or absorber of that electricity so having these little uh, pockets of limestone every so often going up the grand gallery would actually create these low frequency filters or filters that would absorb that frequency there and maybe it had something to do with uh, helping the wave move up the grand gallery a possible source for these uh, radio waves or whatever kind of waves they were using transmit through here would be this ascending passageway because basically it's acting like a speaker where the ascending passageway would be a waveguide projecting a specific wave into the grand gallery and then that wave would also travel down the passageway to the queen's chamber in a specific waveform and this is kind of how the energy is moving through the great pyramid it's being projected from the ascending passageway into these chambers here kind of at the same time here is a graph that shows the relationship between the Queen's Chamber's niche and the Grand Gallery steps. And this is a chart that shows the frequency relationship between the width of those niches. And if you were to transmit frequencies between them in hertz or megahertz, this is a graph in megahertz. You can see how the Queen's Chamber here is the first, um, first five steps the Queen's Chamber and then the rest of them are the Grand Gallery and you can see how they kind of create a nice little relationship between each other. All right, moving on. Okay, so in the antechamber, the most important thing to take away from this is that it is behaving like a high pass filter. So if those granite leaf blocks, whatever you want to call them, porticule blocks, where in place today this is kind of how they would be uh, positioned, they'd be hanging from their little curved inserts and the reason you want them hanging is so that you can have them set off of the ground by a specific amount. Nobody knows what that was set to nowadays, but it would uh, basically gate the frequencies coming in there to only allow certain frequencies to pass into the next room. That's the whole point of a high pass filter. You can look it up for yourself. If you're interested in that kind of thing, this would be called uh, um, a passive audio high pass filter. And I mean, when you're dealing with waves, it's, it's any kind of a wave, audio wave, electromagnetic wave wave characteristics behave the same way, it's just that the mediums that they encounter change their behavior. So here, we have granite blocks hanging, that means that they're kind of like electromagnetically conductive, so that they would absorb the electromagnetic waves coming through here. That's the whole point of having granite there, and the rest of the room is sort of lined with granite except for a few specific places to kind of absorb those waves as they come in and to help conduct those waves through this room into the king's chamber. Okay, so the king's chamber is designed like the perfect resonator and it's a room that's 10 cubits by 20 cubits and if you consider the height all the way up to the peak of that uh, little house shape thing at the top it's 40 cubits to that height so it's like 10 by 20 by 40 it's multiplying itself by 2 so if you were to project a wave into this room it would amplify it almost and multiply itself okay and then the coffer or that sarcophagus the stone coffer that's in the middle of the room is actually one fifth the volume of the king's chamber itself the outer the outer dimensions of the coffer is one-fifth the volume of the king's chamber and the inner dimension is one half of the outer dimension of the coffer so it's like multiples of each other in this room quite amazing and then if you notice how the five spirals spiral into this room that coffer is sitting at a very special position and if this coffer happened to be a capacitor a really giant capacitor which like would capacitate it would be storing energy like a battery and then releasing it slowly over time uh, what it would do is take this frequency that's coming into the room and store it slowly before releasing it again so it's kind of like delaying the wave that's coming in it, it adds a delay to it and that's the whole job of this room right here 
And then of course we have those two antenna connected to it, so whatever information was being generated in this room would be projected out these antenna, the uh, so-called star shafts or air ventilation shafts. And then if you look at these blocks that are above the king's chamber, they're all granite beams and they're kind of like positioned on their ends and there's lots of granite beams positioned beside each other actually when you look at them on the side and they're all different heights. Some people have kind of theorized that they're all tuned and if you actually hit them with a hammer, they kind of ring like bells. So they're all kind of under stress. And if you put granite blocks under stress, they kind of behave like batteries. They end up generating a piezoelectric current through them. So this whole setup is almost as if they're trying to use granite blocks to generate a piezoelectric current, and then they've got them all tuned to specific frequencies. So possibly to kind of like create a wave, almost like a lens of a, of a laser beam or something like that. It's adding a huge amount of electrical energy to this room. It's basically the point of those granite blocks up there. It's to create a huge static electric effect. Okay, moving on, I just wanted to show some details about the Grand Gallery here. There was that uh, step at the top, they call it the Great Step, it actually had like a bowl-shaped curve in it. Nobody really knew why it was there, they'd come up with all kinds of theories, but it basically helped focus that wave coming in and helped it reflect into the antechamber. It's very necessary for it to be there. And also here I want to show how the well from the subterranean chamber connects to the Grand Gallery. And I believe that that was blocked off at one point with a granite block. I also think that the reason why they had all these granite blocks sealing off these areas was to create uh, sealed air so that the air doesn't flow in the in the chambers and because um, if it did it would actually cause a whole bunch of noise in the radio signal which is also the reason why you wanted to keep the air temperature at 20 degrees Celsius and constant is because if that temperature changed whatsoever it would add huge amounts of noise to the radio signal so all these things are kind of in place to minimize noise in radio it's the whole point of it so down here we have a grotto which is a really weird shaped little pocket that I don't know if it was created naturally or later on by uh, treasure hunters but it does create sort of like this twin sort of weird vortex shape if you were to pump air or water through there or gas perhaps of some kind it would kind of like spiral it around and create a vortex maybe help push the air up or down or gases or whatever they were trying to do it's very possible that they had the great pyramid full of oxygen or maybe it was full of hydrogen and it could have been fed from this uh, ground down here this is just a theory i don't know it could be uh, it might, it's not necessary you don't need it but oxygen is a highly magnetic substance so it could uh, react to these waves quite readily. All right, so in the subterranean chamber, it's like an also really close to a phi rectangle being 16 cubits by 26.85 cubits. And it has these really odd shaped projections out of the ground and everything. And they say that if this was an unfinished room, but I think it was uh, finished this way on purpose. I believe that a lot of these things in here, you know, happened afterwards when people came in and they were digging around the pyramid because uh, there's historical records that say they moved earth around the pyramid when they were digging and, and creating their tunnels and stuff. They put the earth in different places. Places. And I believe that the, one of those places was down this well shaft because they had found it full of debris uh, later on in history. So I also think that in the subterranean chamber there might have been equipment that's now no longer there. There's also some granite blocks in some weird places uh, that shouldn't be there. And I also believe that this um, little tunnel that goes to the end of the subterranean chamber was there to help project a traveling wave down in the opposite direction because if you create a vibrating air in this sealed off area it would help project the wave backwards as it uh, echoed back down this back down that little hallway it's a really narrow small little channel but it's perfectly cut square perfect square cut channel so it's intentional there's a reason for it also i have a theory that uh, the bottom well there connects to the outside temple the mortuary temple i guess some conduit might uh, might show up later in the future people will decide to, to look for it but um but yeah and also here uh the great pyramid had a doorway not too many people know about that, but the Great Pyramid did have a door that opened one way and when it was closed you couldn't tell that it was like sealed off so flush with the surface of the Great Pyramid. And it only opened one way and it was really easy to open from the outside. Like it, it, it basically would open quite easily if you pushed on it from the inside outward. And I believe that it was used as a pressure valve so when the, when the pyramid, whatever was going on there, if it was producing gases like say taking water and creating hydrogen and oxygen down the subterranean chamber to be used in the Great Pyramid, that uh, all those gases would eventually build up and pressurize this descending passageway and then that would have to be released and eventually the pressure would build up enough to open up the door and that would release the pressure. That's just one theory. Not too sure exactly what its purpose is but that kind of makes sense to me. Moving on. So here's how I believe the pyramid was being controlled is by using these uh, so-called mortuary temples because they're behaving like waveguides also but on a much larger scale. 
If you transmit waves through these buildings, they actually focus the beams and tune the beams into specific frequencies. These uh, so-called valley temples would be where the main signal was being projected from, and then they would travel down or up the causeways into the so-called mortuary temples, and that's how they would transmit the signal from wherever, whatever, into the Great Pyramid, or, or from the Great Pyramid to whatever they were doing with that signal. Looking at it on screens, I don't really know, but the causeway makes a perfect waveguide. How are they transmitting this information, you might be asking? Well, here's one possibility, is that these so-called mirrors that they had made out of bronze, which were made as far back as uh, 2900 BC or so, which is like the time, you know, around then apparently when the pyramid was built, who knows? Nobody really knows these dates and stuff. You know, it's just educated guesses, really. But regardless, these ancient disks would act perfectly like antenna. Here. Beside are the modern comparisons to our uh, modern gigahertz antennas that we use for wireless Wi-Fi transmissions, right? So with these uh, particular disks, they would work perfectly in the causeways and stuff like that because they're transmitting at those specific frequencies. It's really amazing. These disks were between, you know, three to five inches across, and that's kind of like the three to five megahertz range, I believe. I could be wrong there. Don't quote me on that. But uh, definitely these would work as antenna. They're basically the exact same design. Even down here in that little hieroglyphic thing there, it's kind of showing like, you know, holding a mirror with, with the antenna on a pole and etc etc and now if you look at their uh, so-called temples the temple of Karnak and so on and so on with all these columns standing and stuff you might wonder why they're there if they're not just there for support they could be there for other reasons looking at this electrically electromagnetically these things are perfect radio telescopes almost or wireless wave telescopes working in the megahertz range or even the radio signal range but uh, the distance between the gate the doorways and the columns that's really where the wave is traveling down and when you have these giant groups of columns grouped together like that and you transmit a wireless signal through there, then those things will actually store energy like a coil of wire does. They work, they behave the same way. They will store up energy and they'll, like a battery growing until that whole place is saturated. And they act like a waveguide to guide the wave down the center. So they're transmitting some kind of wave down the center of these so-called temples. And I'll show you why I believe that in a second here. Here's a modern groove guide, waveguide. So when you're talking about 5G frequencies, they use something called uh, these groove waveguides in order to transmit the waves down. And they are just made up of a series of pins with conducting plates on the bottom and the top. And when you compare this to a temple setup, like the so-called temples with their columns and everything, they look pretty similar. If you want to look into this more, you can look up gap waveguides, except that uh, the, the waveguides that we're talking about are on a much lower wavelength. Okay, here I just show you how the temple is connected to the pyramid, and there's a little well that goes into the ground there that uh, nobody is allowed to go into. They covered it up, like in the past photos you can see there's just a wooden cover over this well. And I believe that that well went down and connected somehow to the subterranean chamber where they were able to transmit information back and forth. And so the information would originate from the valley temple, wherever there was some kind of information being generated there, where it'll travel up the causeway to the mortuary temple. The frequency will be tuned a little more before it gets put into the pyramid and transmitted outward. And then here I just quickly want to show you that down in the bottom corner here, this little diagram is showing a representation or simulation of how positive negative waves travel down a series of uh, pins or columns. And remember, granite is extremely electrically conductive because it does contain little particles of iron and stuff like that. Here's what's left of one of the valley temples. And what's interesting to note are these little so-called boat ramps where the boats would apparently dock, because this area was filled with water down up to these little uh, so-called boat ramps. But to me, they're more like water inlets or, or maybe some kind of filters where water would flow down and under and maybe through some kind of equipment there, which would draw that water into these um, temples to be used. Or maybe they were housing some kind of generators there that would be turned by the water producing power. I'm not sure, but this temple down here, is, it's almost Almost like a perfect water intake system that we use in our modern industrial facilities like like power production facilities where they need to take in water and use it to produce steam and then they put that water back this is kind of like what's going on they're using this as a water intake of some kind perhaps maybe i don't know it's just a theory but these are definitely where the signal was generated and then sent up the causeway Okay, and one quick note about uh, where it's positioned on the Earth, because some people have noted that the Great Pyramid is positioned almost in the center of all the land masses. And, I mean, if you're dealing with radio signals coming from space and stuff, this would make it really efficient to use the entire Earth as a antenna collector. Basically, it uses the entire Earth as an antenna, possibly, to collect the signal and then use it for whatever purpose it needed to. So, to wrap things up quickly, basically, all I'm saying is that uh, this Great Pyramid looks 
exactly like a transmitter for radio signals. You have the radio signal being generated from the ascending passageway into those chambers, which act like an amplifier modulator. And then we have the queen's chamber producing the carrier signal. And you have the king's chamber producing the modulated amplified signal. And they're both being projected at the apex of the pyramid and upward into space. And I believe that they were sending that signal to some point in the galaxy along the hydrogen line for some kind of communication purposes. That's my theory. Leave a comment down in the comment section below. And I can get in more detail if you want, uh, just let me know. And I'm sure there's like tons and tons and tons of information that I left out, forgot to mention. I hope that opens up your mind a little bit to uh, some of the other possibilities here about how this thing might have possibly been working. Maybe I'll go into more details in other videos, but thanks for listening. Have a good one.